This class is about biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering is the finding the optimal, optimal, optimal solutions to biomedical problems. So we'll talk about optimal a lot. It's not just any solution, but trying to find the best solution in some sense. We're going to learn about biomedical engineering by following one specific disease, diabetes. We'll track how the technology has changed over the past 100 years or so to improve the diagnosis and treatment of diabetes. Let's start by talking about this man, George Minot. He was one of the first great physician scientists in the United States. George Minot was born in 1885 to a prominent Boston family. An ancestor of his, also named George Minot, but with two T's, had emigrated from England in 1630, and he was one of the founding members of Harvard College. His name's on the charter. George Minot's mother's family was also well-connected. Her father was Henry Austin Whitney, who graduated from Harvard in 1846 and eventually became an investor and president of a railroad. Railroads back then were like the internet companies of today. They were blazing the trail to new areas in the United States, and a tremendous amount of wealth was created by the railroads. So George's grandfather on his mother's side was a very wealthy man. George's father, was a physician on staff at Boston's finest hospital called the Massachusetts General Hospital. And George's uncle, Charles Sedgwick Minot, was a professor at Harvard Medical School from 1880 until 1914. He was also the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the leading scientific society in the United States. George lived the life of a wealthy child. His family, paid, his family paid servants to do all the chores around the house. George spent his summers, not in the hot city of Boston, but on an island off the coast of Maine, Bar Harbor Island. And he spent some time in the winter every year, not in the cold city of Boston, but at Palm Beach in Florida. He attended private schools in Boston, and when he finished high school, there was really no question about what he was going to do next. He would attend Harvard College. He enrolled in Harvard College in the fall of 1904. At the time, Harvard followed the elective system, allowing students to select a few courses in their study. Most colleges at the time had a sec had a set curricula. You just, there were no majors. You just took whatever the college offered. And most, in most cases, it was a very uh, liberal arts education. There were a few engineering schools, but those were different. You wouldn't do engineering at Harvard College. You would do engineering, for instance, at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, at a different school. But Harvard did allow students to select a few courses on their own. And George Minot selected a few. He, he chose to concentrate more in chemistry, essentially. So he had a few extra courses in chemistry. He graduated in 1908. And he was unsure about his future. He did what most rich kids would do at the time. He spent the summer just traveling around Europe. When he returned to Boston in the fall, he thought about it for a little bit and decided that he would follow in his father's footsteps and enroll in medical school. So he went down on the morning of the first day of classes and enrolled in Harvard Medical School. That's how it was then. There wasn't um, a great demand the way it is today for elite medical schools. There were many medical schools across the country 
not all associated with the university. And these were often for-profit schools set up in small towns. And the entrance requirements were usually minimal, uh, not even requiring a college degree. Harvard Medical School had changed drastically in 1905. They had rigorous entrance requirements, which included a four-year bachelor's degree and some evidence that a student had a good knowledge of physics and chemistry. So because of that, Harvard had rather high standards and uh, there weren't that many students interested in medicine. And there were many other medical schools that had lower standards. There just was plenty of openings at Harvard Medical School. So it was below capacity. We'll, we'll talk more about medical schools around that era when we look at the Flexner Report in a coming lecture. The Flexner Report came out in 1908, right when George Minot was going to enrolling in medical school. And it described the state of medical schools across the United States and Canada. <clears throat> anyway, in four years later, George Minot graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1912 with 54 other men. I said men. There were no women graduating from medical school in 1912. George wanted to be a house pupil at the Massachusetts General Hospital. A house pupil is kind of what we'd call an intern in a resident program these days. So he was one of 12 applicants just from the Harvard Medical School for that program. And the Massachusetts General Hospital was only accepting six that year. So it was fairly competitive. So George Minot went for an interview. He had to go down there and, and interview in front of a selection committee composed of four physicians that, had wor that were working at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And one of those was his father. No surprise, George got the job. So did his friend and cousin, Francis Rackman. So as you can see, connections played a big role in George's life. Um, I know all this because Francis Rackman, George's cousin, wrote a biography about George that was published in 1956. It's a great book, kind of hard to get a hold of. I think I bought it for a few dollars on eBay. No one really cares about it anymore. Um, but it describes George Minot's life in great detail. The training program at the Massachusetts General Hospital lasted about 16 months. After that, George was at a crossroads. He could either practice medicine the way his father did, seeing, treating patients, or pursue research. That was a new thing at the time in the United States, research, medical research. It didn't really exist at Harvard or anywhere else in the United States at the time. Uh, medical research was really only performed in Europe at a few universities and at one place in the United States, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So through his connections, George got a position at Johns Hopkins University to learn how to do, to do this medical research. He spent a year or so there and then returned to Harvard in 1915. Well, he returned to Boston in 1915 and he was hired as part of the Massachusetts General Hospital's uh, plan to build up medical research at the facility. George set up a laboratory there and his research interest was, was blood. He, wanted to, he was interested in studying blood under a microscope. He would take blood samples from patients with various diseases and look at the blood under the microscope. He kept detailed notes of what each blood sample looked like and eventually could recognize many features that were invisible to other physicians. 
George observed that some blood cells were fully developed and others were immature. In turn, he could recognize some diseases by the characteristic appearance of their blood cells. Since the source of his blood cells were patient samples and the patients were in the wards right next to his laboratory, he could see how different treatments were affecting the appearance of these patients' blood. He primarily focused on diet as a treatment. At the time, a number of diseases were being cured by adjusting the patient's diet. In 1916, he published an important observation. He learned to identify reticulocytes in samples taken from the bloodstream. Reticulocytes are the precursors of erythrocytes, which are the mature red blood cells. So reticulocytes are kind of like the baby red blood cells. Uh, their formed reticulocytes are formed in the bone marrow, then expelled into the bloodstream. While circulating around the body, they take a day or two to fully develop into erythrocytes. Once he learned to identify and count the reticulocytes, he had a measure of blood creation activity. George could then apply this measure of new blood creation to different treatments and disorders. George started to focus on a disease called pernicious anemia. Patients with pernicious anemia typically exhibit symptoms of fatigue and weakness. The symptoms progress and sometimes abate for a time, but inevitably led to death within a few years of diagnosis. You've probably never heard of pernicious anemia because it's not something we run into today. One of the difficulties in finding the treatment for this disease was the occasional remission. Fatigue and weakness were not easily quantifiable. And it wasn't clear exactly when the remission would begin or end. So identifying the agent responsible for the emission, for the remission, was difficult. In one study, George observed how 15 patients with this disease responded after removal of the spleen. He noted a significant increase in the reticulocyte count in these patients that coincided with remission of the observable symptoms. So there is something, right? The, he can identify and count reticulocytes in the bloodstream. Take a blood sample. Uh, reticulocytes indicate the production of new blood cells. And when that goes up, the patients feel better. So we'll get to this later on, but pernicious anemia, what we know now is it's simply a vitamin deficiency. They didn't know that at the time. And, and um, so it was largely, it ended up being cured by diet. If you eat the, the wrong things, you don't get enough of a specific vitamin, you can get pernicious anemia. Now the Massachusetts General Hospital was affiliated with Harvard University and Harvard University was trying to expand biomedical research. And as part of that, Harvard University opened another hospital in 1912 called the Collis P. Huntington Memorial Hospital. It was named after the man who built the Central Pacific Railroad, Collis P. Huntington. This hospital was created specifically for cancer research. Although it housed patients, they were there to be studied. Of course, they also received the best, best treatment available, but the hospital was built on the principle of serving cancer researchers. Now, George found his research was gradually aligning more with the Huntington Hospital. He focused on blood. And one of the Huntington's main research focal points was leukemia, a cancer of the blood. George spent more and more time at the Huntington Hospital. 
And eventually, the director of the Huntington Hospital asked him to move his laboratory over to the Huntington Hospital. In September of 1921, the director of the Huntington Hospital announced he was leaving to take another job, and they asked George Minot to take over to be the director of the Huntington Hospital. So it's September 1921, George is 35 years old, and he's really one of the leading biomedical researchers in the United States at the time. He's now the director of this, one of the leading cancer research hospitals in the United States. Within a month, his whole life would be turned upside down. This is what happened. He took off work on a Wednesday one week because his brother was getting married and he had to help prepare for the wedding. During this day off, George was reflecting upon his own health and he was thinking about how tired he felt during the past few weeks. He was also frequently thirsty and had been drinking a tremendous amount of water. He knew what this could mean. So he went to the hospital and ordered a sugar test for his own urine. Seeing the results, George immediately knew that his life was nearly over. He would probably be dead in three years, certainly within five, because he had diabetes, and it was September 1921. And there was no cure for diabetes. Take a breath, you fill up my lungs. Uh, and if my mind's working. 